Choo! Dracon beams. That's what we're looking at in today's analysis. Analysis number 54, Dracon beams. So, I've got a little model here. This was actually 3D printed. It hasn't been painted yet, but that's what the 3D model of a Dracon beam looks like. Ghost of Essen, to, Ghost of Essam did this picture here, which is quite a different design, but it still has the same look about it. I'm sure you've seen the TV show version of a Dracon beam, where it's just a handheld flashlight or torch. Yeah, so this is what Animals fans seem to think that a Dracon beam looks like. Let's have a look at some quotes that occur throughout the series, which give us clues to how these things look. By the time I was up, Chapman had reached his desk and opened a drawer. His bloody hand came out with a small pistol-like device I had seen before. It was a handheld Dracon beam. The men stopped firing guns. They started firing lasers. I slid the Dracon beam into the pockets of the blazer, and then I stepped out into the world of the Yerk Pool. If you reach into your purse for the Dracon beam, I'm sure you have. I will kill you right here and now, traitor. Visa One's hand was in the purse. Then, with one sharp talon, I pulled the trigger on the Dracon beam. Jake raised the Dracon beam. Sorry. He thumped the guard over the head with the butt of the weapon. The pilot pitched the helicopter forward in a steep dive. Sunlight glinted off something in the passenger door. A Dracon beam. So those are our indications of the appearance of the Dracon beam. Lala, why is it always during video? It's because I talk. When I talk a lot, she's like, Ooh, for some reason, that is a, uh, that excites me. And she comes and she does this. Why? No, no, I can't. So it's described as pistol-like. So hence this shape. So shaped like a pistol. It's uh, in back to before when the animals aren't actually familiar with these and they haven't been told what they look like, they call them lasers. And what do people think of when they think of lasers? They think of something that like this that shoots like a beam, a, like a beam of light, typically red. And it is red and we will get onto that, those quotes. So it's, it's like a pistol laser, but it's also, it's got the trigger because it got his finger on the trigger. So both these designs have triggers on them. There's the butt of the weapon, which is the underside. So I think this design has, a, this one's got a larger butt of the weapon to bang, uh, whereas that one's quite small. But speaking of size, and this does vary, but we're talking mostly about the ones that humans wield now. They're very small. So in those quotes, it was able to be hidden in a jacket pocket, and jacket pockets don't tend to be very big, and Visa One's purse. So this size here is probably about right, in those two cases specifically. But there are more aspects to the design that we will cover more as we go along, because it's sort of tied in with other features of the Dracon beam. For example, there are different sizes of Dracon Beam. In fact, quite a lot of different sizes. And yeah, we will get onto that. So we've covered the basic appearance. I think that's the first thing. It's basically like an alien pistol, effectively, in these cases, most cases, some cases, maybe. Um, so now let's, let's talk about them. They are the handheld Yerk weapons. Usually handheld, sometimes they're built into ships. But they are the main long-range weaponry for the Yerks. Now, where did they come from? Let's look at a, look at some history of the Dracon Beam, how the Yerks came to have them. The shredders we captured were being altered. The Yerks called this new weapon a Dracon Beam. It did not kill as cleanly as a shredder. It caused more pain. There are three known mining camps where the Yerks are busy extracting iron. Bauxite, nickel, tin, copper, and uranium, as well as various gemstones I'm told are useful for focusing shredders. The largest construction area is two valleys west of here. It is well camouflaged, having been dug back into the slope of the valley. 
We suspect that they have built 14 fighter craft based on a new design but similar in capabilities to your own Andalite fighters. These fighters are armed with two Dracon beam weapons, a blending of Andalite shredder technology with some Ongachic particle wave technology. So some interesting things there from the Hawk Bajir Chronicles. And probably the most interesting thing about it all is that it was developed from and directly from Andalite Shredders, which are the Andalite long-range handheld weapon majigs. So Shredders probably look a lot like these designs. But there is a, a couple of bits in there. Firstly, the Yerks modified the Shredder. Alger suspects that it's because the Yerks wanted to cause more pain. And forgive me for not being a complete sucker, but Andalites do have their fair share of propaganda. And it sound, that's a very propaganda sort of thing to say, isn't it? They modified our guns. Why? Because they wanted to hurt people more. They were that they were so evil that they just wanted it didn't it didn't benefit them anyway, they just wanted people to be, be sadder more. Yeah, that's that sounds like propaganda to me. But there must have been a reason to modify the shredder. Because why didn't the Erks just use the shredder? But there's a couple of few bits in that second quote there that were yeah, very interesting because one of them says that they're fitting Dracon beams onto bog fighters, which is their new spacecraft. And those Dracon beams are a combination of Andalite Shredder technology and Ang Ongachic technology. Specifically, Ongachic particle wave technology, which is basically physics jargon. Uh, particle wave is, I mean, that's what particles do, like, <laughs> they, they go in waves, like, like particles <sighs> will go in woo, 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 waves. So that just sounds like, that's just sci-fi. So I don't think we can take much from that. But they combined Ongachic technology with Andalite Shredder technology to make Dracon beams. But in that very same quote, Dak Hammy tells the Andalites that they're mining certain elements in order to focus Shredder fire. So, on the one hand, they've already got Dracon beams. And they've basically combined Shredder with Ongachic technology. At the same time, they're focusing Shredders. So, that's implying that they've got Dracon beams, but they also did something else to the Shredders as well. But we never see Shredders again after this point, so whether that just ended up being an abandoned thing, like they're trying to do something else, or maybe it was what became eventually the Dracon Assault Cannons? which we will touch on, but not do a full video on. But either way, there's these two things going on. One of them became the Dracon Beams, which is uh, Shredders combined with Ang Ongachic technology, and, one, and the other one is they're basically focusing Shredder Beams. And I think those are two distinctly separate things, hence why Dak Hammy mentions them separately within the same paragraph. So what then is a Dracon Beam? Well, we can then imply that it is not hyper-focused shredders. We've made the distinction that it's a different thing, so therefore it's not the hyper-focused shredders. It's a shredder combined with some particle wave thing. What that is, I don't know. <laughs> and it's sci-fi, and this video will be 10 hours long if we decide to go too in-depth with this. So that can be up for comment speculation. Go give your comments below what the what the ongachic particle wave technology did to these buggers so we know that dracon beams came about during the 1960s six, late 60s when the hawk bajir invasion was going on so they haven't been around for too long but then again the empire hasn't been either so yeah for whatever reason they decided these shredders aren't good enough we need to have our own things I reckon it's like the Americans because we gave them perfectly good sports in football and rugby and they said, nah, -uh, we're going to make our own and they're just basically going to be rip-offs, only slightly worse. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's how it happened. The, the, the Yerks are basically Americans. <laughs> they just take from their superiors and make slightly worse things, basically off-brand stuff. It's like if Britain was the movie Up. America would be that rip-off movie, What's Up? And uh, yeah, if you've seen any bad movie review channels, you might have seen that one. 
So, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. And a Dracon Beam is an off-brand shredder. But it's most to be pretty heckin' painful. And it's stated as much in the series. The female looked at the weapon. It's called a Dracon Beam, huh? What's it do? Arbron answered before I could suggest he shut up. It fires an energy beam which causes an exceedingly painful death. Which is why we'd really prefer it if you didn't fire it. Now we're not told whether Shredder fire is painful, but it's just implied on multiple occasions that it's that the Dracon Beam is more painful than a Shredder. Is there a reason for this other than Yerks are bastards? We're not given any, and there's no real way to. Um, all we can do is speculate. <laughs> all we can do is speculate on why. Potentially, because Andalite technology is, we can assume, more advanced than Yerk technology. And these things can attack ships if the weapons are large enough. We can assume that Andalite ships are probably better defended, whether it be by like force fields, shields, or simply the alloys or metals that they use for their ships. So perhaps, whilst on the Horpidia homeworld, the, the, um, the Yerks were experimenting with making weapons stronger. Because perhaps the Shredders were strong enough to defeat opponents of the Andalites, but they were deliberately made so they couldn't destroy Andalite shields. Which, in a way, seems quite smart. It would have its flaws, but, you know, we're operating on basic sci-fi here. So, yeah, perhaps that's the case, and the Yerks thought, huh, we need to adjust these things somehow so that it can destroy Andalite stuff. And hence why the experimentation phase, focusing shredders, uh, combining it with the Ongachic technology, a big experimentation, basically the industrial revolution, but for the Yerks and for weapons. So maybe just the consequence of making them more powerful or combining them with other technologies in order to destroy Andalite ships also made them more painful if you happen to get hit by them. Now, apart from it being pretty bloody painful, let's just cover a few more... some of the things that it does, the way it operates, and the, the colour of it. So on here, obviously, you can see red, and that's for a reason. And uh, firstly, it makes a humming noise when it powers up. Then power up the Dracon beams. The engines began to whine. The Dracon beams began to hum. Now these are ship-based Dracon beams, but since they're still they're also called Dracon beams, we can assume they're using the exact same technology. And so on these ships, it whines and hums as it powers up, because they say power up the Dracon beams. So it takes time for the weapon to build up the energy to then unleash. And we get more proof of that later as well. You'd probably think on smaller things, such as these handheld pistol-like Dracon beams, it takes less time, but consequently they're probably also less dangerous. Whereas ship-based ones are probably far more powerful, but they take longer to build up, or they require a lot more energy to build up just as fast, or processes, or whatever. Anyway, uh, what colour are the Dracon beams? Well, we have a pretty solid answer, but then there is one exception. Fire! Vistus Three yelled. Burn his ship! The night exploded in blinding light. Red beams lanced from the blade ship and the remaining bog fighter. The Andalite ship glowed and with a strange slowness disintegrated. A brilliant stab of red light shot from the dark upper windows of the log building. The beam hit the base of a tree not six inches from me. The wood was vaporised. A six inch hole was blown right through its trunk. Dracon beams. The air over my head crackled with the sound of Dracon fire, flashing blue and white like lightning. So most times in the series, the Dracon fire is red. And that's pretty consistent throughout the series that it is a red colour. Bang! Redness. But on this one occasion in Book 47 The Resistance, they're blue and white. Which is very, very strange. 
And why is there screaming outside? Fricking kids. Burn them all, I say. Yet on this one occasion, in book 47, they're blue and white. Why? I reckon it's probably just the ghostwriter having a weird moment. <laughs> the rest of that book is fine, but... And I didn't even notice that when I was reading the book originally. But upon researching, I thought, eh, why are they blue and white? Part, maybe, maybe, because this is when the... I think this is when the blue band Hortbegier entered the fray. Maybe they've got special Dracon beams. And maybe the white is just the red, but like on any bright light, sometimes it comes up as white. But that's just trying to explain away what is probably just a writer error. So we can just be pretty sure that the standard colour is red. Okay. Oh, and if you hadn't already guessed, it is light. And it is very bright. The Dracon beams, they are made of light, and so they are very bright. What a lovely poem. Dracon beams, bright as a sun, lanced through space. So it's bright, it's red, but what, what's it made of? Fry, you worms. There was no recoil, not like a regular gun at all, but a beam of intense red light lanced from me to the bridge. It burned a hole through the window, sliced through a fat taxon and began slicing up control panels and instruments like a hot knife going through butter. I squeezed that trigger for as long as I could. There's an important clue in that quote, and that is that there was no recoil. What does that mean? Now, it's been a long time since I did A-level physics, so anything I say now could well be wrong. Uh, so please do go into the comments and yell at me if that is the case. So, if there's no recoil, that means there's no equal and opposite reaction thing going on. So, if um, if I slap my own hand like that, when that slaps, there's two opposing forces happening, and they're equal. They're going in opposite directions. And I should probably use a better analogy. But you know what I mean. You've probably done these lessons. I don't need to explain the basic concepts of that to you. But what that basically means in this case is that if there's no recoil, then there's no force going that way. Because with a regular weapon, you will get recoil because you will, the bullet will go that way. And because it's going out in a big old burst, you get an equal burst going the other way, which is why you hold your weapon nice and steady. You don't put your eye to the scope of the weapon for that reason. Because if you hit your eye to the scope and you get that reaction, you're going to have a gun like popping out the back of your head, right? You don't want that. So, yeah, there's no recoil when Tobias fires this beam. So, the beam is therefore. Well, yeah, let's, let's use, try to use physics here. So, light particles have no physical presence and if there is it's very minimal they must they must have some level of oh christ go back to 16 year old me 18 year old me back when i was in school um but yeah it's basically a light beam because then you wouldn't you wouldn't have the recoil you know when i the freaking cat light when i fire that you know little cat laser it's not going like that is it it's just tick and yeah, same with the flashlight, because you're, you're firing light. So we can safely assume that this beam isn't a physical object, it's a concentrated light energy. That's what we're looking at here. That's what all my rambling has amounted to. It's concentrated light energy, and I don't know why I'm doing this action. It's to get my point across. Ah. Bang, bang, bang. That's what you get. But surely it makes a sound when you fire it, because else it's just not satisfying if there's no recoil. Where's the bang, bang, bang? No, it's just eh, eh, eh. So surely there's at least a lovely sound that accompanies it. I thought I heard the sizzle of Dracon beams. 
I heard shouting and the eerie zap of dracon beams being fired. Tread of fire, the sound so like a dracon beam, was different enough for any Andalite Aris to recognise. So there you get descriptions of the sound of the dracon beam and they're pretty standard laser sounds really, so zap, zoo, and sizzle. Yeah, pretty bog standard really. Oh, and uh, an obvious boom at the end, of course. So this energized light, it's, it's still very confusing in, in how it works, uh, but it's basically just an, an, an energy beam. Um, and there's one point in book 17 where Rachel has got this little little handheld one and she goes right up to close to someone and shoots him at point blank. So, so what happens in that situation? I stepped right up to him so no one would see the flash. I lifted the dracon beam and squeezed the trigger. Zoo! Ah! The dracon blast was too close. Some of the energy bounced back off the man and stunned me. It was like grabbing a bare electrical wire and jamming it into my stomach. I clutched my stomach and backed away. So this is, we get a, a description of the sensation of being glanced with one of these. So yeah, he gets shot there, but for whatever, how it works is some of it always gets deflected back at her. It feels to her like being jabbed with an electrical wire. So an electric shock, basically which is unusual, very unusual, because everything else about this series describes it as more of like a heat thing. Yeah, like, like it's a, a concentrated heat. So why it didn't feel more like a burn than an electrical shock is unusual. I think it would make more sense if it felt like a burn, but hey-ho, what do I know? It's sci-fi. <laughs> but let's, um, we'll, we'll probably get more clues as we go along because now we're going to look at what ex exactly a dracon beam does to a living organism. It, it does this. I mean, I've been in one-on-one -on -one combat to the death with seven foot tall Horpagee warriors, and I've been shot at by dracon beams that sort of disintegrate you slowly. Disintegrate you slowly. Now this is something that doesn't seem very, well I wouldn't say it's not consistent throughout the series, but we never get given an indication on how, what, what it means by slowly. Because there are a lot of times where it's just poof and you're gone. There aren't many occasions where it's like, you know, you shoot someone and they're just sort of there for about 10 minutes thinking, oh no, there goes my arm, oh there's my elbow, there's my shoulder, Christ. You know, it's, it's not like that. But that could also be down to power levels, but we'll also get into that. There is a lot to discuss here, and it's probably a lot of me rambling, but you know, you're probably used to that by now, I imagine. I think I do eventually get to my point. Comment below. Does my inane rambling become an issue when it comes to understanding what the hell I'm talking about sometimes? Or, or, or am I easy enough to follow? Just let me know. <laughs> Don't even say anything, Medi bollocks. I know what you're gonna say. You, you stay out of this or you get zapped, right? And you horse, bloody members, you get zapped first. <laughs> but now we get, quite conveniently, in book 24, the Animorphs are on top of a Helmicron who gets draconed. Yes, that's natural word, draconed. In fact, here's the quote to prove that that's natural word. <laughs> I drop down, down below treetop level to avoid getting draconed myself. Yeah, don't go thinking I don't have receipts for everything I'm talking about, yeah? Anyway, but in book 24, the Animorphs are sitting on top of a Helmicron. Obviously, they're shrunk, and the Helmicron gets draconed. And so they see, at a cellular level, what the ruddy happens, okay? So let's go see what happens. We were gazing up at this sight when the eye blazed a brilliant red. I could see the individual eye facets close in rapid response, but it was more than light. A wave of heat propelled on a hurricane came rolling across the great plains of the Helmicron's head, and across the flat head of the Helmicron came, came something no human eye would ever see, at least not in all its horrifying detail. I think we both knew right away what it was, but your mind doesn't want to believe what it's seeing. The flash had been the light of a dracon beam. Light is light, of course, and is equally fast whatever size you are. 
But as the wave of energy spreads through the body hit by a dracon beam, the physiological reaction of cells blowing apart happens more slowly. Axe explained to us once that this was a unique Yerk technology. The Andalite Shredder, whose technology the Yerks used in developing the Dracon Beam, kills instantly, painlessly. The Dracon Beam is specifically modified to destroy more slowly. The Yerks want their enemies to feel the agony of cells exploding. And now, standing there on cells whose molecules vibrated beneath our fly feet, we saw the line of destruction advance. Cells erupted, exploding like mini geysers, swelling with steam, blowing nuclei and mitochondria and flaming cytoplasm like shrapnel. That is a brilliant description. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I actually quite like Book 24, the suspicion is for moments like that. But that aside, it's described as light. So it's a beam of light, but it's light energy and very concentrated light energy. And once again, we get that thing of, oh, they're like shredders, but the Yerks just wanted to be more evil. So they made them more evil. Again, I don't quite buy that. There's probably, I mean, right, this is where death of the author comes in, okay? The authors might have sat there thinking, oh, let's just write it so that they made it more like that. But me, I'm just like, no, no. Death of the author applies here. I think that, you know, the Yerks probably had a, a different reason, you know, and it just so happened to be that way. I mean, maybe they weren't too displeased with the side effects, but I hardly doubt that they modified something. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't think they would have modified it to make it more evil, okay? But, um, yeah. And if you don't want know what death of the author means, it's not me wishing death upon the authors. No, it's not that. What it means is basically, once the author's work is out there, it's entirely down to the interpretation of the reader. Go, go look, it's a fascinating subject, go look it up um, if you find the time. Death of the author, I forget who coined it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But what happens is this Helmicron is hit by a Dracon beam. I'm not sure about the size of the Dracon beam. Uh, or we just see it from the perspective of the Animorphs who are more to fly and are sit on top of this Helmicron head. So to them it's just this blinding beam of light. But all the cells around just explode. Which implies that, yes, it's basically light energy that is so intense that it basically puts so much heat and energy into everything it hits that it just blows it all up. Which, which makes sense. It does. I don't know how they would operate it, but like in theory, yeah, I think it makes sense. There are occasions where it doesn't seem very consistent. So a lot of the times when something gets shot by a Dracon beam, either it gets grazed, or the whole thing sort of sizzles and disappears. But there's this one case in book 53 which I found unusual. The general nodded. The cameras are always on. Now get out of my way. He motioned the sergeant to open the door leading out into the main chamber of the underground readout. The sergeant took up a firing position half in and half out of the doorway. A Dracon beam annihilated the half of him that was exposed. So most things that get hit with these Dracon beams, they just poof in a puff of smoke, up they go. Um, Ta-ta to the whole lot of you. But this one guy steps out and half of him gets hit and that half just gets destroyed. But the other half is just, so it's just half a man standing there, which is quite gruesome, really, for a kid's book. Let's be freaking honest. Let's be honest, authors, come on. Um, yeah, you're right. But, yeah, it just seems a little bit inconsistent at that part, you know. How does this actually work? But there could well be explanations in that. So let's look at the power of the Dracon beams. Let's firstly list off a bunch of things that we know it's capable well, this technology is capable of destroying. Let's give you a list now of things that it can destroy. They will be here soon to eliminate all traces of me and my ship. How can they do that? I had Cassie wondered. The alien seemed to smile with his eyes. Their Dracon beams will leave nothing behind but a few molecules of this ship and this body, he said. A Dracon beam sizzled the air above me. Unfortunately for the Hawkbeard who had fired, the Dracon beam did not stop when it buzzed by me. No, the Dracon beam hit the underside of the vast truck ship. 
A small, neat, round hole appeared in the bottom of the ship. It was too small to amount to anything. Are you the only one left? The only Andalite here? Yes, I am alone. When the blade ship appeared unexpectedly, they caught us off guard. I saw the main section burn. Dracon beams damaged the orbital stabilization of this dome. It fell. It splashed into the ocean and sank to the bottom. Down the length of the valley, three bugfighters swooped, firing their Dracon beams. The sonic boom of their passing shook the stone beneath my feet. Zoo, zoo. Dracon beams ripped open the stone walls like an arm blade going through rain-soaked Stuhler Park. Dracon beam fire. The asphalt disintegrated below us. The tree trunk exploded right in front of me as the Dracon beam turned its sat to steam. Heat scorched my face. If the Yerks wished to kill a lot of the humans, they could simply use their Dracon beams from orbit to ignite the atmosphere and incinerate all life on the planet. So there's quite a range, really, of things it can take out. So a handheld Dracon beam can turn sap into steam, blow trees apart. Dra uh, bug fighter Dracon beams can blow through walls and stone, uh, rocks. And Axe even says that the most more powerful Dracon beams can just basically, inst basically destroy Earth. <laughs> so quite a range there. But they're not always the most effective. A lot of the times, they're, they're little more than glancing blows, and then there's power settings, and then sometimes the book just seems to forget that they're really that powerful at all. I was facing down a controller in a purple and pink Dunkin' Donuts uniform. He was holding a drake on being, smirking, the little jerk. Zoo, zoo. He fired at point blank range, hit me right between my three foot long tusks. I roared in pain and anger, mostly anger. Like a couple of Dracon beam blasts are enough to take down a 1300 pound African elephant. So these things are capable of a heckin' lot of damage. Except in book 42, where at point blank range, a portable shredder barely even scratches an elephant. And this is a thing that in other cases, as soon as the Dracon Beam hits something, I'm holding it like one of the, those cops from the 80s American shows, they hold it sideways. Yeah, that's cool. As soon, like a deer gets hit by one of these things and it just whoosh, sizzles and disappears. But Rachel at point blank range, and remember we've seen point blank range before, even damaged the Rachel. This, <laughs> When Rachel fired at point blank range, she was like, oh, oh, my stomach, my stomach. But now I hear that, yeah, it's not very... But this is book 42, remember? <laughs> Let's just remember that. But yeah, Rachel's like, Dracon beams, they're nothing. Oh, dear. But sometimes, it, yeah, it, glancing blows aren't, of course, as dangerous as a direct hit. And we do get a few examples of that here. I felt a burn across my back a glancing blow from a Dracon beam. I saw a seared line of blackened flesh drawn down Rachel's side by a Dracon beam. There was a burn right across the skunk's back, a perfectly semicircular burn, as if someone had simply sliced a scoop out of it. Dracon beam, I whispered. You were there, weren't you? Poor baby. So if there was to be a glancing blow, then you get a burn and quite a vicious burn a lot of the time, which which is strange. So in the case of the skunk, there's like a semicircular like gouge out of this skunk. And you'd think, wouldn't that count as a direct hit? If it's that close that it just leaves like a crater <laughs> in, in the skunk? It, it does seem inconsistent sometimes, but a lot of it could potentially be down to power settings, and we will move on to that soon. But yeah, if you get hit by a glancing blow, it basically becomes a burn. Unlike, of course, in Book 17, when Rachel did it right against someone and it was like an electrical jolt rather than a... But this is why I said that earlier. It's weird that she described it as like an electrical jab rather than a burn because every other situation where it's like a glancing blow or something like that, it's put down as like a burn. So... Annie caught is in the house and 
gavel hits the thing. It's a burn, not electrical sensation. Book 17 got it wrong. All It was retconned. All the other books got it right. Right, that's it. Donzo. As far as I'm concerned. But the Dracon Beam is also used in more subtle ways. So, for example, and yes, I know I'm talking about book 42 again. Don't know why I bother. I think it's 42. Is it 42 or is it 24? No, my bad. It's actually 24. <laughs> it's actually 24. I apologise, book 24. You're all right. Book 42, sod off. Book 24. Visa 3 has defeated the Galaxy Blaster, which is one of the Helmicron ships, using a Dracon beam. But then he's holding the ship triumphantly. It's a meeting of the sharing. Visa 3 is here at the secret part of the meeting. You know, where only the leading controllers attend. He's playing show and tell with the Galaxy Blaster. He smoked it with a Dracon beam, I guess. He's holding it up and babbling about the Helmicrons. Chapman is applauding. You then get an interesting bit in number 53, the answer, where we talk about dispersion. And it's the first time we talk about it, Dracon Beam Dispersion. Granted, it's a ship-based Dracon Beam, it's not one of the handheld ones. But yeah, this sort of makes sense about of the lot of stuff we've seen so far. So let's have a quick look at that quote. If they fired the main Dracon cannon on widest dispersion, it would not kill the men on the ground quickly. It would kill them slowly. They would cook. They would grow warmer and warmer as the diluted Dracon energy heated them up hotter, hotter till some began to pass out. Others would go crazy as their brains fried. And then the men, those already dead and those who still clung to life, would burn. So, imagine if, right, beam, straight line, energy completely focused in a linear fashion, constant, strong energy, okay? It would be bang, as if it were like a shredder, it would be instantaneous. But if you spread the beam so that it got gradually weaker as you went outwards, depending on where you are in relation to it, it changes the severity of what happens to you. So if you're right close, like right in front of it, you probably die instantly. If you're really far away, then it'll barely affect you at all. But if you're like in the middle, like somewhere around here, then you're going to get the worst of both worlds. It's going to take a long time, but you will eventually burn and die. So, yeah, Drake, that's Dracon cannons, by the way. And we will do a separate one on that, but we'd basically talk about the how Dracon beams work, as in the technology. Okay, so it's able to be dispersed, and because of that, its effect lessens the further out it is. Okay, so it can be used as a laser, so it's like pinpoint, so it's constant energy, or it can be dispersed, so that energy lessens as it goes out. Does this mean then that the adjustment made to Dracon beams from shredders is that it unfocused the beam? You remember back in the Hortbergia Chronicles quote, quote, they did two things. They had a Dracon beam and then they had shredders where they were focusing the beam. Perhaps they had that. And then with the Ongachic technology, they were able to disperse the beam over a wider area, which would allow this sort of stuff to happen. It would also mean that, yes, it probably would be more painful if you got hit by it, because the energy is spread. The energy is still coming, uh, and it's all still there. It just gets spread. So it takes longer to destroy, potentially. So that would all sort of add up, but that's me joining the dots where maybe the dots weren't meant to be joined but again death of the author those dots are there i'm seeing them i'm connecting those dots i'm drawing this particular picture so how would that work exactly perhaps in shredders that and like technology it's just like a straight cannon effectively so you've got your source your energy source and it's just shot straight through and it's not built to be dispersed it just goes along in a straight line which does seem quite dangerous, honestly. But then again, whatever. Perhaps the Ongachic particle wave technology, whatever the freak that was, perhaps what that did was it 
cause the energy waves to yeah, disperse, to spread, though maybe retaining the energy? No, I doubt it, because then that last quote wouldn't work. But maybe it was just a way of using, building something into these machines which allowed those waves to spread to a varying degree. Perhaps that's it. Perhaps that's what causes the power settings differences, because we will move on to that next, power settings. So maybe it comes into that where you've got your higher power setting, which pretend, maybe that means it's more focused, it's more of a linear thing, or maybe it's low power, where there's maximum dispersal of the beam, so less focused and less deadly, but still just as deadly if you just hold it on them for longer. Maybe that's the case. But one thing before we move on, let's just cover the the burn thing, okay? And I was tempted to do it on MS Paint, but I'll just I'll just use my arm, okay? So pretend my arm is a Dracon beam, a beam of Dracon fire, okay? So paint it red, my arm, and my shoulder is the barrel of the weapon, and the arm is a Dracon beam flying out. Okay, so a direct hit would consist of the central part of the beam hitting the target. So the closer into the middle of my arm you get, the more concentrated the beam. The further out, so you move out from bone and you get to the outer layer of skin on my arm, for example, the less concentrated the beam gets. So, if you get hit directly, bang, you're gonna get a right old wallop around the face and you're gonna, you're gonna get hit so hard you're gonna dissolve, that's what's gonna happen. But if you just get a glancing, like a graze, like that, like, bleh, then you're just gonna get a burn, <laughs> okay? So I reckon it's like that. So the center of the beam carries more energy and that level of energy, so it's not quite like my arm because my arm has a definite end to it. You get the skin layer and then there's no more arm. But imagine you got your central bit to the Dracon beam, and then as you could move outward from it, less and less energy. So what happened with the skunk is basically like if, if it was my arm, didn't get hit like head on, but it that bit happened there. It, it got hit by the not quite, get this straight Adam. It wasn't a direct hit, the center of the beam didn't hit, but like the periphery of the beam, like the, the skin level of this beam hit. And so it didn't cause a complete dissolving, but it burned a lot of the cells and then just stopped burning. We've also got the case of the guy being uh, burnt in half, dissolved in half. That's a bit of a strange one because if it took out a half of the body, you'd think you'd take out the whole body. But again, maybe it was such a powerful beam, like as a proper Hortbergia, like a portable cannon beam, like a freaking RPG Dracon beam. The blast is so big that the center of this beam, like my arm, is massive, like the direct hit, but then the glancing blow area, the periphery of this beam is also massive. So maybe the, the sergeant got hit by the periphery of the beam, but the beam was so massive that the periphery basically just burnt off half of his body. That's where I'm gonna leave it for today. I'm going to come back, for, I'm gonna have a change of clothes. <laughs> you just wait and see. But um, yeah, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna to go to bed. So I'll see you in a few seconds to carry on the rest. And we're gonna talk about power settings. So go get yourself a brew now, pause this video, and then come back and rejoin me in my new change of clothes now. There we go. So let's carry on looking at the old Dracon beam. We're gonna look at power levels now, power settings. And I'm now gonna give you a, just a series of quotes going over the power settings, and then we'll discuss at the end. Let's look at those quotes now. I stretched my left arm to reach the panel, popped it open. Yes, a handheld Dracon beam. 
old and dusty and probably badly maintained, like most Skritnar things. I found the power setting. I set it at the lowest intensity. What are you doing? Arbron yelled. I have to land the ship, Arbron. Keep quiet or I'll stun you. If you fire that thing, you'll kill me, Arbron said. You have the setting backward. That's originally a Yurk weapon. Setting one is the highest setting, not the lowest. Suddenly, I knew what Arbron would do. He couldn't rise up, but he could still scuttle forward. He came straight for me, rushing and slithering as if he were aiming his round, red mouth at me. He was trying to force me to shoot him. To shoot him with the Dracon beam set on maximum. But I was too fast for him. I twisted the dial to ten. I fired. And just as my finger was tightening on the trigger, I realised Arbron had outsmarted me. He'd lied and I'd fallen for it. Arbran had always been a better student than me. He was a qualified exodatologist. He knew alien systems far better than me. I tried to stop, but my fingers squeezed. The Dracon beam fired on maximum power. But by chance, or maybe by some desperate, too late twitch of my finger, the beam missed Arbron by a millimetre. Instead, it blew a two-foot hole through the hull of the ship. I raised my hand and squeezed the trigger. Tzoo! The Hawkbegeer dropped like a sack of dirty laundry. I stepped over him. He was still breathing. I was breathing, too, in ragged gasps. So, that was the low power setting, I said. I said you could carry a Dracon beam for protection, Jake said firmly. But we had an agreement. You would not fire above setting three. Yeah, well, it didn't even work. What's wrong with this beam? You're one lucky worm, Jake said to me privately. Axe saved your butt. He modified her weapon so it wouldn't fire beyond setting three. She lied, Rachel said coldly in private thought speak. Strike one. She'd have fried you if she could, Tobias. You'd be a smouldering pile of slime if she'd had her way. I say we end this right here. She can't keep a deal. Three corridors converged together at a pair of wide blast doors. Hawk Bajir and human controllers pressed close together. Dracon weapons on medium power, Visser One ordered. When the door opens, begin firing. Fire until your power cells run dry. Do you understand me? Medium power won't damage the machinery, but it will kill every living thing in there. I aimed. Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
that gives a chance of killing somebody. So the lowest setting, we also know, is capable of knocking out a Hort, uh, stunning a Horpigeer. That's the lowest setting. But then we also have to consider, oh no, wait, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. In the underground, Rachel grabs a Dracon beam and it's too big, so she has to reach around like that, but she's also able to hide it in her clothing. I, or, or she's able to like hold it really subtly. To the point where she goes right up to someone, like sneakily jabs, jabs into their back. I don't know, it's, it's one of those things where you never get really told the size of these things, but whatever. So setting one is powerful enough to stun. Setting three is sort of the maximum before it starts being able to kill somebody. So basically the first three power levels are able to stun, possibly to varying degrees, I don't know. Anything above that is likely to kill. And then we also get cases where they're able to blow holes in ships, which I can only imagine is basically setting 10. It is pretty strange though, because when Alfangor shot towards Arbron, he mistakenly shot at full power on 10. And it misses Arbron by millimeters, but we get no description of there being like burns or anything like that. And every other time we get a close shave, for want of a better word, or maybe that's actually the right word. It gives like severe burns. I mean, look at the skunk back in book nine. It basically a semi carved out of its body. Every time there's a glancing blow or, or a near miss from a Dracon Beam, it leaves a massive burn. Except it does nothing to Arbron. But again, this is the Andalite Chronicles we're talking about, and that book has several consistency problems. So we'll just put it down to the authors being consistently strange in that book. Don't forget, this is the one this is the book where the living asteroids just vanished. So I'm not expecting great consistent writing from Andalite Chronicles. Let's just put it down to that. So to conclude this little section, you've got one to 10, one being the lowest, 10 being the highest. How that, cause I don't think, uh, maybe on some weapons, like a uh, human, no, cause controllers would have these weapons. They speak Galard. So why would they need to translate signage on the Dracon beams to, I don't know. But we've got one to 10 and somehow they just know which one's which. And 10 is strong enough to blow holes in ships and one is able to stun Hawk Bajir, which does make you wonder why back in book 42 when Rachel was, Rachel was shot as elephant at point blank range, range, it was barely a scratch. But once again, just like the Andalite Chronicles, sometimes you've just got to say, the author of this particular book was off their tits, most likely. Leave it at that. So we've sort of covered in there as well the different types of Dracon beams for different alien races. So we know, for example, that there are human ones, ones sized for humans. We know that there are ones designed for Hawk Bajir hands. And we also know from the books that Taxons are able to carry Dracon beams, which you'd assume are also specifically designed. Here are the quotes to back up these three things that we know. Around the Visser, two Hawk Bajir guards deployed. Each was holding a Dracon beam. Not that Hawkbajir ever looked like they needed weapons. I leapt. Cassie jumped. Side by side we sailed over the startled Taxons. They fired their handheld Dracon beams, but too late. The beams sizzled the air behind us and we blew past. I could, by shifting ever so slightly, see the men. Two guys who looked like regular security guards. Except for the Dracon beams holstered in their belts. So that is confirmation that there are different designs for different races. So you imagine the Taxon, because they've got like pincers, they've probably got a really wacky design. Like they probably strap on, on the back, because pincers, you know, it's not gonna be very <laughs> good for holding. So they probably got some sort of strappage going on. Hope dear, just big, massive. So for, I mean that, I don't know, that one looks like it might be, because it's got the th like three finger segments there. But yeah, this one looks more like a human held one. Okay. But there are also other modifications for Dracon beams and the Yurks actually sometimes get quite inventive. So let's see what else Dracon beams have been found in slash on. Hunter robots, Axe yelled. We should leave. Why? I asked. 
but at that moment, I had my answer. Tzu, tzu, tzu. Three narrow dracon beams fired from the balls. I watched the bald man casually shift his gaze to another seagull. This seagull, too, spasmed in midair. It recovered and began to haul wing out of there. Not one of us, a regular gull. Axe, what is that guy doing? I don't see any weapon. Axe sounded as shaken as I was. He may... He may be using a very low-powered dracon beam. Possibly hidden on his body, with the sunglasses used as emitters. Are you telling me he can shoot whatever he's looking at? I said. Yes, it will cause intense pain, as you may have noticed. It is as you suspected, Prince Jake, Axe said. This controller has added security devices since our last infiltration. There are motion sensors camouflaged as a mirror frame in the front hallway, and I suspect dracon beams concealed in the eyes of a statuette facing the doorway. I barreled, full speed, heedless, horn down for the door. Wham! Crunch! The door exploded inward. The frame ripped, plaster and moulding showered. Rachel bellowed, right behind me. Tsoo tsoo! Hot, screaming pain, the stench of sizzling hair and flesh. The dracon beam in the statuette fired again, burning another black, smoking hole in my armoured hide. It hurt just enough to make me even madder. Now the rhino brain was enraged, too. I drove forward, through the doorway, slammed into the far wall and knocked the dracon concealing statuette over. We get some rather fun examples there. So, on the one hand you've got the hunter robots, which are these floating balls in the earth pool. Yeah. And they fire little pinprick ones that shoot out like zoop, zoop, zoop. and uh, they shoot the bats, they blow off Rachel's wing, which again makes you question how the dracon beam firing actually works. It's, it's just very varied, isn't it? But on top of that, you get two infinitely cooler versions of the dracon beam. You get the sunglasses dracon beams. That they suspect that. It's not like confirmed, but it seems to be the case. Axe certainly seems to think it's the case. Where they've got these Dracon glasses and it's got like a control somewhere, like they've probably got like a vest on which feeds into these sunglasses. And the controls can look at something, press a button and fire like a, a weak Dracon beam. Probably with like a wide dispersion as we <laughs> discussed earlier. Shocking what's in view. Now that's pretty damn cool. And I'm looking forward to the analysis looking specifically at that. So we'll cut that one there. I want to do a specific analysis on that at some point in the future. The statuette is also pretty nifty. So Chapman, and you'd assume more than just Chapman, if Chapman's got one. Probably a lot of sort of mid to high level ranked controllers, human controllers, have these sorts of defenses. Where it's a little statuette and it's got little dracon beams in like the eyes or the hands or something like that. You know, that's pretty inventive and that's pretty damn cool. I like that. I'll probably do a, a similar analysis looking just at that. But yeah, it just goes to show that the Dracon beams are very versatile and you can put them in all sorts of different things. So long as you've got something to store it, like the energy producing thing in, and fire it off like that. On top of being versatile, they are very portable. I mean, obviously, very portable. And it can also be put on things like helicopters to start forest fires. The helicopters were a mile away, maybe a little more, so I heard nothing of them. But as I watched, I saw the sudden red spear that shot down to the ground. Again and again and again, the helicopters fired their blazing dracon beams down at dry trees and even drier underbrush. They were starting a forest fire. It's never made clear that dracon beams on helicopters are actually fixed to the helicopters or whether it's controllers within the helicopters firing, because we do see it a few times throughout the series where helicopters are firing off Dracon beams. But yeah, we never get that confirmation of whether it's just a guy. Sometimes it is a guy in there like that, but we never know if there are actually any fixed Dracon beams. But we do know that there are fixed Dracon beams and Dracon assault cannons on Yerk ships. On, on the Bugfighters and the Blade ship, for example. I don't know which ship fired the Dracon beam whether it was one of the bugfighters or the blade ship. It turns out that there are indeed bugfighters and, and the blade ship, that they both have dracon beam capabilities as we do see. But we actually get a name for the specific type of dracon beam that is on the bugfighters. And we get a description of what they look like on this particular ship. That bugfighter has twin penetrator class dracon beams. 
and we can't trade shots with them. Bogfighters are the small, basic Yerk spacecraft. They look like a streamlined cockroach with two long, serrated spears pointing forward. Those are the Dracon beams. This is the only time we ever get confirmation of this sort of thing. So on the Bogfighters, they got these twin spears jutting out at the front, and these are what the Dracon beams come out of. So obviously you've probably got the, um, the energy uh, box, for want of a better word, at the back, where the energy builds and then it fires through the spear that sort of concentrates it. And because of that, you probably think they're quite powerful beams. Because as we discussed earlier, more focused means more powerful. So these Dracon beams going through these spears, you can assume then, are quite focused, quite powerful. They're called Penetrator class. Which also implies that there are more classes, confirming the idea that there are multiple, there are different types of Dracon beam. But this is the only one we ever get given a name, the others don't. But the Penetrator class Dracon beam is the one we know is found on the Bogfighters and we know roughly what they're capable of doing. So they're capable of attacking large items, uh, ships, walls, that sort of thing. And, and the name Penetrator class which is a funny name, uh, is capable of penetrating walls, metals, that sort of thing. So with these spears, they create long, focused beams that are capable of penetrating armors, shields, that sort of thing. So it all makes sense, that seems logical, and I think that's, yeah, I think that's a pretty strong conclusion to make. Things like a strike on cannons and the wide dispersal ones that Visfri talked about earlier, uh, that we discussed earlier in this video, they're probably a different class of Dracon Beam. What are these Dracon Beams on Bugfighters capable of? Well, we get a good example here. Missiles flew from the F-16s and the jets broke away. Two Dracon Beams fired and the missiles were destroyed in mid-flight. So that can be very, very accurate if given the right pilot, of course. Because we'll see in a moment just how it works from within the ship. But they're capable of taking missiles mid-flight. And missiles, as you probably guess, are pretty speedy buggers. So they are very capable weaponry. So now let's look at what it's like for, if you're sitting in the cockpit of a bug fighter, uh, what's it like operating these Dracon beams? Axe glanced over. That was the safety. The Dracon beam should be armed now. See the screen behind you? The red circle is how you aim. Use a combination of moving the joystick, but also use your mind. Marco put his hand on my shoulder. Phasers on full power, he said in a Captain Picard English accent. Arm photon torpedoes. If the Borg want a fight, we'll give them one. Make it so. I moved to the joystick and watched the target circle track across the screen. It still showed nothing but starry sky. That should be safe enough. I squeezed the second button. Zoo, zoo. Twin red beams of light fired forward, converging too far away for me to see. Yes, most splendid, Marco yelled. Okay, that was cool, I admitted, trying not to cackle like an idiot with his first video game. Boys with their toys, Cassie teased gently. I swept the red target circle toward the black diamond head of the blade ship. I squeezed the trigger, and I kept squeezing. Brilliant Dracon beams stabbed toward the blade ship, but at the same instant, the visor fired. Dracon beam hit Dracon beam. Zhow! An explosion of light so intense I could see through my own hand. I could see Cassie's teeth inside her head. So according to this, in this bug fighter, I believe it was a, was it a new model of bug fighter in the Forgotten? I believe it was. Uh, a new but we can only, only imagine it's using the same penetrator class Dracon beams. So it's, they're powered by a joystick and there's like a red target screen, which is excellent. They, they gotta make a video game where you're in like Animorphs Universe Fires. Come on. That sort of thing. It'd be like in a proper old arcade, wouldn't it? But yeah, and it shoots the, the lasers, Dracon beams. But there's a target and you move the joystick around and then you fire and out shoots the Dracon beams. It's like being in a video game. It does also show how good the pilots in the previous quote were. If they're able to shoot missiles out of the sky using a joystick thing, 
then they must be pretty bloody well trained in these things. Which usually Yerks don't seem to be well trained, but maybe they developed homing Dracon beams. They haven't done that, as far as we know. <laughs> Plus, I don't think you'd be able to make homing Dracon beams, considering that they're just light energy beams, rather than a physical missile object, which you can put programming into. So, but then again, that's going from 2020, 2024 human perspective. You know, maybe you can do that. I, we just don't know it yet. I'm sure somebody in a bunker somewhere does. But anyway, fun little thing. In the Fagon, from the quotes that we just got, that's where we get the Sario Rip. It's where two Dracon beams, probably on high power, com collide, bang, in the middle of space. It creates a Sario Rip. Axe came trotting out of the bugfighter. He wiped his hands on a rag. Thanks to Cassie's observation, it seems pretty clear that when we and the blade ship fired simultaneously and the Dracon beams intersected, we created what we call a Sario Rip. A what? A Sario Rip? What's that? We blew a small hole in space-time, and we were drawn in through that hole. So, th this is unusual, and there's got to be some sort of Elemis shenanigans going on here, surely. Because not n never in the history of this war have two Dracon beams intersectors and gone bang. And is it every time that happens a Saria Rip is created? I mean, potentially. I mean, Axe knows the name of it, so it must be a relatively common phenomenon. It's not like this thing just happened for the first time ever and Axe is like, that's a Saria Rip. Like, he just came up with it. Oh, I know that. That's, that's a Saria Rip. <laughs> wink, wink. No, so... Yeah, maybe that's how powerful these things are from ships. If they intersect, they rip space-time in half. Somehow I doubt it, and there must have been something else at play here. It's Animorphs. You know that the Mr. Cryak are getting involved somehow in this. Come on, surely. I don't think Dracon Beams can usually do that when they intersect. But that's just a fun little tangent there for you. Speaking of fun tangents, Let's talk about energy overload. Now, this happened once. And once again, it's in, I believe, a bog fighter. And we get this in book 45 of the Revelation. And, and this happens. This is the quote. She looked up at Axe. Send the Dracon beam supply into overload. She mosses. What? I said. Axe, did you hear that? She said to send the beam supply into overload. Axe turned his stalk eyes. That will explode the ship. It will destroy us. Axe, listen to her. Does your mother wish to see us die? Axe said privately. Axe, she's free now, I said. She's free. It won't explode the ship, she went on, gagging with the effort. Not if you time it right. When the Dracon power supply reaches 155% of maximum, shunt it to the engines, then fire the beams to bleed off any overcharge. So this is the only time we ever get something like this, overcharge. And who knows if it's just limited to spacecraft. It could well be. But apparently they charge it. Uh, Lila, please. And you can charge it over 100%, which seems like a... Is that a design flaw? Surely. Surely there's not... There's a safety thing on there. Like a... Uh, well, what's it called? Uh, a safeguard. That when you get to 100%, it, it shutters itself. It stops more from going in. But no, apparently no. But then again, when have Yerks ever been health and safety conscious? <laughs> there is that. Isn't that right, Lila? So, obviously this has been done before, hence why Eva knows about this. Obviously getting it through Idris. And they load 155% Dracon supply into it, which is just enough, apparently, that the ship won't explode and they immediately thrust it into the engines and shoot off any overcharge so that simultaneously shoots them out of the place and also blows the yurt pool up or something it's been a while since i read the book i think that's what happens i think they basically just throw a bunch of jargon in there and hope it's stuck and I, I sort of think it does but it's also it could be a bit clearer don't know if it happens with these i don't think so because if it's just a trigger pull then there's no time to charge it. I reckon it's probably just a spacecraft thing where they charge it. So remember earlier where we had Vicious 
somebody saying power up the dracon beams and it whirred and it hummed so it builds power then unleashes which must be a bit of a nightmare for the pilots shooting missiles out of the air because you fire oh wait no hold on we need to charge it up charge 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 then fire you can't just bang 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 straight away apparently although maybe you can maybe build up power and then you start shooting but if you keep shooting the power runs down and you have to let it warm back up again that seems pretty logical actually yeah i like that idea so in spacecraft they build it up to like 100 percent dracon power and then if they start shooting in fact, yeah, this does make sense, because the Dracon cannons get drained in Book 54. Yeah, that makes sense. So they build it up, but then if, as they use it, the, it drops down, so it has to recharge. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. But probably not for Dracon beams handheld, okay? Those are just bang, bang, bang sort of things. And you've got power settings there, so it probably does actually store the power in there. So probably once you adjust the power setting, it probably takes a moment. So yeah, probably is the same, actually. What am I saying? Let's now look at some Dracon Beam modifications. Basically Dracon Beams, but there are examples in the books where they're modified for this or that reason or for that particular race. Let's just basically list them off. The door of the bugfighter opened. Out stepped a Hortbegeer warrior. Seven feet of razor-bladed death. The Hortbegeer swung his horned snake head left and right, all the while holding a portable Dracon Beam weapon. This is unusual because most times it'll just say Dracon Beam, but this time it goes out of its way. And this is like in book 14, so it's not like right at the start of the series where, you know, they're not quite sure. This Hawkbegeer steps out with a portable Dracon Beam weapon. So not a handheld Dracon gun or whatever. It almost sounds like he's come out with a big frick, like an RPG or, or like that. He's come out with a big mini gun Dracon Beam. So that sounds like a, a modification, a different variety of the dracon beam. Let's look at some more. We had slipped through the hologram. I could now peer down cautiously from the lip of the vast hole the Yerks had made. In the centre was a single structure. It looked like some power station or something. Blank steel and bits of this and that jutting out at odd angles. Atop this structure was something that looked like a miniature Washington monument mounted on a swivel base. Is that the dracon beam? I've never seen one that large, I said. Axe swiveled his stork eyes toward me. The size is embarrassing, really. If the Yerks were any good at engineering, they could have an equally powerful weapon a third of that size. Is it powerful? It could vaporize entire mountains on your moon, he said flatly, or destroy an Andalite ship in orbit. This was never, I don't think it was further described, but it's just this thing hidden in this Yerk base, and it looks like the Washington Monument, and it's got a swivel base, and Axe basically says it could destroy mountains on your moon. I'm assuming this is a Dracon assault cannon, which we will cover in a separate video, but it's just said to be like a Dracon beam, I'm pretty sure. Tobias asks, is it a Dracon beam? And Axe doesn't say no, so we can assume it is a form of Dracon beam, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a, an assault cannon, okay? And we'll cover that next, not next time, but sometime in the future. Let's look at the Sea Blade from Book 36, because that seemed to have modified Dracon beams. Let's have a look at some quotes. Jake, we can't get another clear shot, Cassie cried. The ship's too fast. We can't get under him. Yeah, and this underwater Dracon beam thing is a slight prob. <laughs> the tail section of the Sea Blade was a mangled mess. The ship listed badly to the left. Black liquid poured from its fuselage. We did it. Cassie cried. We destroyed the sea. Zoo, zoo, zoo. Yellow dracon beams shot crazily out of the torn up vessel, as if the ship itself was furious, wounded and out of control. Zoo, zoo. The high powered dracon beams tore through the wall of rock surrounding the narrow tunnel. So the sea blade, which is an underwater vessel primarily, has yellow dracon beams. Why? There's probably some adjustments that they've made to it, which means it's capable of being as powerful as it is out of water, underwater. Why it turned it yellow, I don't know, but we do know that it's capable of, for example, going through walls, blasting out through walls. It's just distinct in the fact that it operates underwater, 
do Dracon beams operate underwater? I think they do, but yeah, whatever. But they're just yellow. <laughs> From the Sea Blade, they have yellow Dracon beams. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Right. Let's look at Squitnar, because they have Dracon beams that they've modified from the Yerks. The Nar captain was pressed back against his command console. He looked scared, but not of me. He was glaring angrily at a bizarre creature that had a Squitnar hand weapon. A modified Yerk Dracon beam pointed at the Nar captain. Can we take on a bug fighter? Are you kidding? All the Squitnar ever have are second hand low powered Dracon beams the Yerks sell off for scrap. The Skritnar, for as little as we see them, do have Dracon Beams, and it's made pretty clear there that the reason they have Dracon Beams is because they bought them as scrap from the Yerks. So, Dracon Beams apparently have a lifespan, which makes sense, and the Yerks then sell them off, which, yeah, again, makes sense. And who better to purchase them than the Skritnar? <laughs> of course. Of course they would be the ones to do the... Lila, please. You're rubbing up against the microphone. Stop. You're making me sad, you know. Can you wait, like, 15 me more minutes for me to finish this video? Are you quite finished now? Yes, that's right, go over there. And don't come back. Oh, come back. But there are other races in the Animorph series who don't have Dracon beams, but they have things that are described like Dracon beams. Like, for example, the Helmicrons. Snoopy and the Red Baron, Marco said. It did look like some bizarre parody of a World War I fighter pilot movie. Only instead of machine guns, the Helmicrons were firing their tiny Dracon beams. I could see singed and burned feathers. These characters actually thought they were going to conquer the world. But then they raised their handheld ray guns at us. And I realized something. Their Dracon beams, or whatever they were, Hadn't hurt me much when I was the size of Mount Everest, but now I was a bug. So the Helmicrons have these ray guns that are like Dracon beams. And then basically what the book does then, it calls them Dracon beams from there on out, but it does, uh, so, Lila, you're, you're really pulling on the microphone. Just 10 minutes I ask of you. They're basically described as Dracon beams from that point and given that name, but we do know that they're just like Dracon Beams, and they just didn't want to give it another <laughs> another name. And there's another case of this as well, and it is the Howlers. He wore a series of loose belts around his torso, and each of these featured a different weapon. Or at least they looked like weapons. Something similar to a Dracon Beam, which might have almost have been an automatic pistol. Knives, small metallic boomerangs, a gun that seemed loaded with darts. A red circle appeared in the door, and began to smoke and burn. It's them, I yelled. Howlers! In the glow of the Dracon beam, I saw Axe walking steadily toward the door. Just like with the Helmicrons, they have this laser weapon that, uh, that the animals say looks like a Dracon beam, and from then on out, they basically used, say, Dracon beam instead of another name. So anytime you see, oh, look, the Howlers have Dracon beams, no, the book just uses that as a a catch-all, basically, for laser, for the laser guns of enemy fighters. It will just say, they're Dracon beams now. Which is unfortunate, because it would be nice if we got... It, it would seem more real if they had their own type of weapon. It's actually a shame that the authors didn't just think, right, we'll just give them their own weapon here. Just, just Instead, they just said, oh, just use Dracon beam. Just use Dracon beam again. No, I mean, but whatever. They just operate the same. Basically, if there's an antagonist in the Animal series of Raygon, it's a Dracon Beam. <laughs> but it's interesting that sometimes the Yerks don't use Dracon Beams, and sometimes they just rely on good old human weaponry. Escape was just a hundred feet away. Freedom. Life. And all that stood in our way was 20 men. Human controllers armed with automatic rifles. It doesn't happen very often, but yeah, sometimes the Yerks will just say, screw Dracon Beams will just use human weapons. In this particular case, in the Android, there's a, Lila, what are you hitting that's making a banging noise? Please leave. <laughs> just stop annoying me today. God. She's gonna come back up now, aren't you? You're not getting the message. The, in this scene, there are two dozen Hortbegeer, give or take. So, they're not afraid about having Hortbegeer there, 
but all the human controls are carrying human weapons rather than dracon beams, which does seem weird, but there must be some reason why the Erks are saying, right, in this particular building, the Matcon building, we're not having dracon beams, you're having these weapons. So that's pretty much covered everything now. There's just a couple more quotes I want to give to you, uh, just on a couple of other details that, uh, that we'll throw in there because I think they're worthy of being in this video, but I didn't know where else to place them. First one. When the Hawk Bajir reignited their resistance on the homeworld after Carthaginophon came down and took their DNA, it's a catchment of Dracon beams that they intend to find to help the resistance. Jake shook his head. Even if the Hawk Bajir agreed, how would some small colony win a war against the Yerks? No ships, no orbital weapon platforms, not even handheld Dracon beams. Yeah, the Yerks have these cute little things called weapons, Marco added. So would the Hawk Bajir, Quaffaginophon answered. Before they lost their lives to the Yerks, Aldria, Eskilion, Falan, and Dak Hammy stole an entire transport ship filled with handheld Dracon beams, as well as a good supply of very sophisticated explosives. And the last quote for today, the last notable thing I think I've found about the Dracon beams, is what happens to them after the war ends. They became part of an illegal arms trade. Dracon weapons were widely available throughout the galaxy. The destruction of the Yerk Empire had spawned a lot of illegal arms trading. So the Dracon beams weren't all just destroyed. They ended up everywhere. Probably falling into a lot of wrong hands, mind you. So that is uh, Dracon beams. I'm pretty happy to, have to think that I've covered everything. I'll just do a, a quick summary now. So it's a light beam, like a, like a Kamehameha way. <laughs> Kamehameha way from Dragon Ball Z, it's like that. So instead of that, it's that. And the power varies. And it has a burn-like effect. And if you get a direct hit, it tends to dissolve everything there. It's a bit inconsistent at times. The speed at which something is killed varies usually depending on the dispersal of the beam, the focus of it. It's typically red in colour, but there are different versions. We have a named class, the penetrated class of Dracon beams, but that seems to be specific to bog fighters with these long serrated spears to create pointed Dracon beams, high density energy beams that are capable of heavy destruction. The Yerks use this in all sorts of things. They probably use other things as well, but this is the main one we know about, and they put it in their portable weapons. They also turn it into big cannon things. So the entire range of weaponry is covered by this Dracon Beam technology. Where did the Dracon Beam technology came from? It was based on shredder technology created by the Andalites, but they combined it with Ongatchik particle wave technology to create this hybrid, which seems to have different effects to shredders, probably something to do with what it's able to destroy so probably a different type of shield or armor but also potentially the means to disperse the wave in such a way as to cause a different sort of damage so that's what i think of the dracon beam what are your thoughts about the dracon beam do you have anything to say about the creation of it how it's used do you think I've I've come to the wrong conclusion about something? Do you think I've come to the right conclusion, but maybe you want to add something else? Do you have anything else to give? Now is your turn to tell me in the comments. It's been a long video, but I wanted to cover everything we knew. There are probably some times where I rambled a lot, but that tends to happen in these ad-lib long videos, because there's <laughs> a lot to go through. And yeah, uh, Ghost of SM, I like that design. He's got a Twitter page, Ghost of SM293. I like this, the 3D printed design as well. So that's a human one. I'm going to say that's a Hawk Bajir one, just just cause. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching. What is the next analysis? Well, I'm changing the way I decide. So now we're going to look at something I've pre-recorded. We're spinning the wheel. And it's got all these suggestions of, basically a list of things I need to do analysis videos of. And there we go, Ellen is the next thing we're doing an do an analysis of. Ellen. You know that great character, Ellen? God, all the laughs we had with her. Right, she's gonna be the next analysis. And, yeah. 
Oh, so that should be a, a bit shorter, I imagine, than this one. Thank you very much for watching. I shall see you next time. Ta-ra from somewhere in the Animos universe. Bye. <laughs>